Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody and welcome to your live safari. A big special welcome to the Northland Elementary School of Virginia Beach, Virginia. It's lovely to have you with us today and you're on a special live safari and we want you to ask as many questions as you can. We're starting today's safari of course with a whole lot of monkeys. The monkeys are having a lovely time sitting there in the water having a bit of a drink and I'll explain to you where they're getting their water from just now. My name is James Hendry. On camera today is Viam. That's Viam's long thumb. Viam is not long at all. We're both quite small actually. And we're looking at these monkeys and I'm sitting like this because it's very relaxing here. It's about 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which is probably the same temperature as it is there in Virginia Beach. But we're in the middle of winter here and you, I think, are in the middle of summer. So we still have the same temperature despite the fact that we're in winter. So let's just have a look at these monkeys. Now what they're doing is they're drinking water out of a hole in the ground. Now that hole in the ground they didn't dig, that was dug everyone by elephants. Elephants are very clever. They're able to feel whether there is water flowing underneath the surface or not. And here there is water flowing under the surface so they've dug a big hole with their feet and with their tusks and the monkeys and many other animals have come down to have a bit of a drink here. So the monkeys are having their drink now and also to the left of them we have some impala and the impala are the most common antelope species here Now I don't know if you guys know what an antelope is but an antelope is basically the same as your deer not quite the same we don't get deer here in Africa but you get deer where you are in your part of the world in North America and this is a similar sort of an animal it's called an antelope and this particular one is an impala. Anyway, it's very nice to have you with us and we're on a live safari which means you can ask me any questions you like and I will try and answer them for you and if I don't know I'll ask Viam and if he doesn't know well then I'm not sure that anyone knows but we'll do our best to answer any questions that you might have. For those of you who are not at school we are certainly welcome to make your comments and questions and please do so. Hashtag Safari Live if you're tweeting away. Otherwise questions at wildearth.tv. You see that one monkey standing up. Can you see that one, Viam? There he is. Oh, he stopped standing up. But monkeys are able to stand up in the same way that human beings are. Well, sort of. They don't find it easy to walk, but they can stand up and they can balance just like we can. And you know, if you think of all the animals that you're going to see today and all the animals that you've ever seen before, you know that none of them stand on two feet like we do and none of them can walk on two feet like we do. We are the only animals in the whole world who can walk for a long time on two feet, which I think is quite interesting. Hello Jack, you're obviously a very clever fellow and you want to know what a monkey's predators are. Well Jack, the main predator of monkeys I suppose would be leopards. Leopards are spotted cats, big cats about the same size as an American cougar if you like and they are the main predators of these monkeys. And the monkeys are very clever you know, they are able to tell each other if they see a leopard. So if one of these monkeys was to see a leopard what he would do is make a noise like this. He'd go and then all the other monkeys would run up into a tree and they'd look and when they saw the leopard they too would start going you see how they're looking at me? They know that I'm not really a monkey but they're just making sure by looking this way and then they'll see the leopard and the leopard will know that it's been seen and it will go away but of course the leopard is very clever and it can hide in the bushes and sometimes the monkey won't see it and then they're in big trouble. But out in the open like this they're probably just fine. Hello Jackson. Jackson, you want to know if monkeys eat bugs. Yes they do you know. They eat fruit and they eat leaves but they will also eat bugs and they're a bit like us in that they will eat both meaty things and vegetable things. 
Now, we have a very special treat for you. We don't often see these here at Juma. My friend Brent is sitting with a much larger primate. Welcome to the Sunset Safari, and isn't that great to start with both of the large primate species we get here? The vervet monkeys and these, the chakma baboons. And they're busy feeding through a guari thicket. Now, the guari still have some tasty little fruits on them, and the baboons are taking advantage of this. So you can often see quite a few of the small bushes shaking about. And also, you can see the baboons directly under the guari bushes, picking up any little ones that have fallen onto the ground. So, welcome. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have a Brian a Joubert and the Thumb, who's had such a tough day, he didn't get a chance to change out of his outfit from this morning. Sad Thumb. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> uh, together, Brian and I are sometimes known as the Killer Bees. Oh, yes. And hopefully we can find you something killer sightings. As you can see, we're not in our normal vehicles, and we've had to modify a Mahindra for, for tonight's sunset safari. Hopefully we will be having a better plan soon. So bear with us if I start talking about what you're not seeing, but I can't see what the camera is saying. But in the meantime, let's get a bit, try to get a bit closer to these baboons. Been sitting here for a while, so they might be a little bit relaxed. Uh, they do tend to run away from vehicles, but it looks like there's a really big troop of them. Now, baboon troops in this area generally are, can be anything from 50 to over 100 strong. I'd say these are probably somewhere between those two. There we go. I'm just going to sneak up. There we go. go. Under the guari bushes. So as we watch these baboons, there's still some more off to the right under the guari bush. Mrs. Hale is wondering, are we able to track, the, track animals? We are, Mrs. Hale, what we do is we look for their footprints and, and then we follow them till we find them. And uh, I'm hoping to find some leopard footprints this evening. Now, having the baboons in this area is quite a good thing because they're like an alarm system for me. So not only do we track by following footprints, uh, we track by the sounds animals make. And if the baboons happen to spot a lion or a leopard, they'll start alarm calling and sh making lots of noise. One left, got left behind. Okay. Incre incredible creatures, baboons. They live in really complex social structures where they have multiple dominant males and there's a lot of infighting for those top male positions amongst the troop of baboons. So they're sort of run by a a group of sort of 10 or 15 male baboons. So let's try to get us a view of them. While we do that, Kalen's wondering, do baboons hibernate? Well, a Kalen, they do not. We don't have nearly as many animal species that hibernate here in Africa. Uh, we have far, far more temperate is probably the wrong word, but they're we don't have as harsh winters and summers as you guys do. So we don't have snow here and it's always quite warm. I mean, today is in the middle of winter. We're sitting at about 25 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, I'm in a shirt and short pants. But the only things we really have that hibernate out here are some of our reptile species, like tortoises, turtles terrapins as we call them. There's one walking down the road. I'm trying to find a big male, but I can't see any at the moment. But these troops will spread out over a really big area to feed. And they're constantly in communication with little contact calls. Or, or make funny little noises. But if they had to see a predator, they would shout, wow, wow. A very, very loud call that you can hear through the bush. And it seems like they're all being a bit shy. So, still on the subject of the chakma baboon, 
Nishan would like to know, do they break trees? Now, they might break some branches in the trees, Nishan, but they're not really strong enough to, to destroy a tree like an elephant. Let's have a look. They're being a bit skittish, so we're going to move on a little bit, see what else we can see, and hopefully we're going to find you some... We'll find you lots and lots of animals today. So while we keep looking in this area for some leopard tracks to follow, let's go see what James is up to on the other vehicle. We are back again everyone and what we are doing is also kind of looking for a leopard in this area but let's see what else we can find. We haven't seen anything since you last saw us but you know my friend Viem is a very hungry fellow indeed. Viem, did you bring a picnic today and what, what is it? Two bananas, Two bananas nachis, four nachis and a, 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 bar. And a breakfast bar. But I, as you all know, your parents will tell you that you need to eat your greens. Viam's very, very bad at eating his greens, everyone. So we're going to help him eat his greens today. Now this tree is called a buffalo thorn tree or zizifus. Can you say that? I'm going to say it once more, then I'm going to count to three and you're going to say it with me. Zizifus. Okay. One, two, three. Zizifus. And a zizifus has got very nasty thorns and it's got very nasty thorns. Here you can see them. Viam will show you the nasty thorns. And that's to stop the animals eating the delicious leaves. And you know, even for human beings, these leaves are pretty nice to eat. And so we're going to give some to Viam because we want him to be healthy, don't we? If we don't want him to get scurvy. Scurvy, of course, is a disease that you can get if you don't eat enough leaves. Here you are, Viam. Mmm. Put them in your mouth. I had some yesterday. Have some more now. What do you think? Oh, not, too bad, mm -hmm. not too bad. Mm. So, it's kind of a natural African salad, if you like. Not the best thing in the world, but it's not too bad. Mm. Let's ca carry on and hope Viam doesn't get scurvy. You must eat your veggies, everybody. You don't want to get scurvy. Your teeth will fall out. Viam, show me your teeth. His teeth are all fine. Now, Sai, you want to know if we have snakes here. Yes, Sai, we do have snakes here. We have many, many, many kinds of snakes. But, you know, we hardly ever see them. That's because snakes don't really want to be around human beings. They're afraid of us. They know that we are predators. They know that we don't like them. And so they hide away when they hear us coming. And they can feel our feet moving on the on the ground and then they hide away and we're also in winter now which means that the snakes much like most of the reptiles where you live will sort of go to sleep for the course of the winter time now it's not cold here but there's no water around you saw how dry it was at that pond where the monkeys were just drinking out of a small hole about that big and so because there's no water the snakes will estivate now, estivate is a kind of sleep that they go into in the same way that uh, hibernate is a kind of sleep they go into in places where it's very cold. So you know that the bears of North America go to sleep during the winter time and that's called hibernation. The snakes here estivate and that's because it's not so cold but because it's very dry and there's nothing for them to drink. So we do get lots of snakes but the chances of seeing one are very small. We might be very lucky though. We love to see snakes. What have you got? No. Ah. Oh, Mrs. Hale, this is a very good question from you, Mrs. Hale. How do you know what's safe to eat in the bush? Now, you can't just go into the bush and eat every, anything, everyone. You must be very careful that you know exactly what plant you're looking at. So over the course of many, many, many years, so people have learned which plants are good for you to eat and which plants are poisonous and which plants are just kind of not very nice. So I know that that Zizifus tree is good to eat because I can identify the tree and I know that over many hundreds of years the people of this area have learned that that's a good tree to eat. But if you go into the wild 
and you don't know what a particular fruit is or you want to maybe try and eat a piece of leaf, don't. Unless you know what it is, you mustn't touch it. And we're just going to look around here. We have been seeing some leopards in this area, so we're just going to look around. Jack, I'm going to ask you what you think about your question. You said, do we get a lot of rain? Jack, look at the area around us. It's so dusty. None of the grass is green anymore, and so we don't get a lot of rain. We get some rain during our summer, so the rainy season is probably only between September and December. Otherwise, no, we don't get much rain at all. And you know, the whole of winter, we normally, for three months sometimes, we don't even see a cloud. It's just this gorgeous blue sky, like you can see above us now. We're very, very lucky to have such a gorgeous blue sky for three months at a time. Now, I'm going to be quiet. Let's just have a little listen. And I just want you to be very quiet, everyone. Just have a listen. You hear that? That's a very special bird called a grey hornbill. A grey hornbill. Now, Kaylin, you ask a very clever question, and your question is how do leopards find their food? Well, leopards have very good noses, they have very good eyes, and they have very good ears, which means that they can find their food either by listening very carefully to crunching in the grass, or by looking, and that's normally how they do it. They normally do it by looking, Otherwise, they will smell their prey. And that there, everybody, is a grey hornbill. This book contains all the birds that we have here in South Africa. And in South Africa, there are 900 species of birds. Now, even though South Africa is about one quarter the size of America, we have more birds here than you have there, believe it or not. And that's because we live in a slightly warmer climate. That's the grey hornbill. He's the one making that lovely whistling sound. Okay, let's carry on. I had some leopard tracks in this area this morning, everyone. You can see what? Oh. <laughs> there we go. Well spotted, Viam. That's the grey hornbill, everyone. Ah, oh, that's very clever. It's a really nice picture of him. Let's see if he calls. I can hear his friend calling from the other side. Now many of you, of course, will have seen the Lion King. And this is Z the Zazu bird. Zazu and the Lion King was a hornbill. And Zazu, in one of our South African languages, known as Zulu, means wise man. Izazu. They don't say it Zazu, that's how we people who don't really know how to speak Zulu say it. They say Izazu. There we go. Right, so I did have some leopard tracks in this area. Let's have a look. Maddie, very nice question from you. You want to know what do the birds eat? Now think about that carefully. If there are over 900 different kinds of birds, do you think that they eat the same thing, or do you think that they all eat slightly different things? And the answer, of course, is that they all must eat slightly different things. Otherwise, there wouldn't be enough to eat. So those birds, those hornbills, eat seeds and fruit, and sometimes they eat small insects as well. But sometimes you'll get birds that eat, uh, they will eat meat, so eagles eat meat, uh, fish eagles, like your bald eagle in America, they eat fish. Some animals, like your buzzards or our vultures, well, they eat... Oh, there's some leopard tracks here of a female leopard, but they're not very fresh. So vultures and buzzards, as you know, they eat dead flesh that somebody else has killed. We're just going to look around here carefully, and if I can, I will try and show you a picture of the tracks of this leopardess. I thought when I came past here earlier this morning that it was from a young male leopard, but I see now that it is a female. And the difference is that one is bigger than the other. Right, let's go across to Brent and see what he has found.
So we're searching the western side of the, the edge of our traverse. We had a rumor that there was a young male leopard to the, to, to the west of us here, and we're hoping he's meandered from where he was last known to be all the way into our traverse area on Juma Private Game Reserve. So what I'm doing on this nice big sandy road is I'm looking for those leopard's footprints. But unfortunately, no luck so far. So the next thing I'm gonna do is head towards a water hole. And at this time of the day, and at this time of the year, it's really, really dry. It's our dry season, and we have a drought at the moment. Uh, water holes attract lots and lots of different animals. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we're gonna find something there. Hi, Aslan. Aslan would like to know, how do I know what animals the tracks belong to? Well, I'm very lucky, Aslan. I've been looking at animal footprints for a very long time. And uh, so that way I do know, I've been, I've been trained to look at the different animal tracks. And uh, one of the other ways to learn, if you see an animal that you don't know its track, as soon as you see it walking, once it's gone past, you get out of the car and you look at the footprints. Lucy. Uh, Lucy wants to know, do we have cheetah? Uh, we do, Lucy. In this part of the reserve where I am at the moment, we don't see them too often, uh, but there's always a chance. That's the best thing about being out in the bush, that you never know what could be around the next corner. So when you see me do this and put my head over the side of the car, it means I'm looking for animal tracks. And over here, we only have Some elephant tracks and I'm hoping those elephants have headed towards the water hole. So Sa so would like to know how do a cheetah catch food? Well by being very very fast. So what they do is they will sneak as close as they can and then they run as fast as they can. They can run about 70 miles an hour and uh, that enables them to be able to catch their food. But so far doesn't even look like. It's cuddling off. Do you see them there, Brian? Oh, they're disappearing. There's some baby Franklin, which is like a equivalent of a grouse to you. And this particular species is called an Atal Franklin. And uh, it, it gives birth to their babies much later in the year than a lot of the other birds. Well, they're not being very nice there scuttling away from us. Aslan would like to know how do lions find their food? Now lions have a slightly different approach to cheetah but still quite similar. They need to sneak much closer because they're not as fast as a cheetah. They can only run about 50 miles an hour. So they normally sneak to within 100 feet or so before charging off to grab their prey. But now with a lot of these animals they're not very successful. Out of 10 attempts at chances of catching something, only successful in about one. So Hi Jackson, uh, Jackson's in the right hemisphere, wrong so are there kangaroos here? No, they live in Australia. Uh, we don't have any marsupials in Africa. So there's nothing going down towards that water hole. So I'm going to head to the next water hole and I'm hoping to find some elephants around there. Hello, Eliza. Eliza would like to know what training do you need to get a job like mine? Well, Eliza, you need to spend lots of time learning about animals. And there are some formal training courses, Eliza, sorry. Uh, there are some formal training courses, but the best training you can get is being out in the bush and getting experience. And 
one thing I really love about this is that you never stop anything. There's something new to see every day. But the animals are hiding from us today. I'm hoping to find some for you shortly. And I do see some animals up ahead. And they were running quite quickly, but there's some that aren't running as quickly as well. So we're going to show you an impala. Now, impala is the most common antelope in Africa. Oh, they ran across the road. There she goes. You can see how fast she is, and she was only running at less than half speed. And so that's what, why it's quite difficult for lions and leopards and cheetah to catch them. There's some more over there. So they're about the same size as a white-tailed deer that you get in America. But they're an antelope. So deer's horns fall off every year. And antelope's horns stay there for the, its whole life. Now, female impala don't have any horns. I'm trying to see if I can spot a boy. He's got horns. Now, Kaylin's wondering, do cheetah blend in? They do, that's why they're spotty. It helps break up their outline so they can sneak closer to animals. So they do blend in to a certain degree, but with all the weapons a lot, cheetah and lions and leopards have for catching animals, now all the other animals that get eaten, they've developed their own set of defenses to be able to get away from them. Now for me, the most fascinating fact about an impala is that they have been exactly the same. They have not changed for 1.6 million years. So it's such a successful evolutionary design that there's been no need to evolve further. So when you find a fossil of an impala from 1.6 million years ago, it, the bones in that look exactly the same as an impala from today. Oh, but we're going to be causing a traffic jam, so we're going to leave them. Now, Sai is wondering, what do Impala eat? Now, one of the reasons, oh, there's a little boy. His horns haven't quite got big yet. They're still growing. Oh, he's going to run across the road for us. Yay, you can see how fast he is. They're very good at jumping. They can jump over 20 foot in one go. Oh, next one coming, Brian. Next, oh, and when one runs, often all of them run together. There we go. <laughs> now, oh, no, there you go. Next one. Here they come. And you can hear them talking. That's the moms talking to the others. Brr, brr, stop it. Don't be naughty. Oh, very beautiful. Look at that little pronk they do there. So they're actually playing now. Now, with a lot of animals out in the bush, playing is practice. Practice for when the cheetah comes. Now, we were asked about what impala eat. What makes impala so successful is the fact that they are able to eat both grass and leaves. Oh, there's a big daddy. You can see he's got much bigger horns. Now, Elijah is wondering how fast can they run? Well, Elijah, they can do probably about 60 miles an hour, but they can do it for a lot longer. Not 60 miles, sorry, about 50 miles an hour. But they can do it for a lot longer than a lion can. A lion is a, a sprinter so, and a cheetah. They can only do it for a very short time and then they get too tired. 
but the impala can keep going for much further and that's one of their ways of getting away from the animals that try eat them well, at least we find an animal we found some baboons some monkeys and parlor and now I'm hoping to find you a big animal, an elephant or a buffalo. So while I try to find you one of the biggest animals in the bush, James has got one of the biggest and most beautiful antelope to show you. Now this everyone is called a kudu. And a kudu is one of our, my favorite antelope, my second favorite antelope. And you can see the male has got very special horns. Those are those big curving things that you might call antlers where you are in the United States. They're not antlers, they're horns, which means they don't fall off. They just get bigger and bigger every year. Isn't he lovely? See how big his ears are? And just like the big bad wolf, he's got ears so that he can hear. Now, Sean, you want to know what they use their antlers for. Remember, these are not antlers. They are horns in the same way that a cow doesn't have antlers. They've got horns and the difference is that antlers fall off. Now why do you think that the males would have horns and the females not? Well of course as you know with many animals the males fight with each other every so often and they fight with each other to attract females and to fight each other off other females when they want to be daddies. And so that's what goes on here. That's why they have got horns. In the same way that your deer have antlers, only the males so that they can fight with each other, it's the same with the antelope here, like the kudu. Now, you've seen that man, that kudu bull chewing and chewing and chewing, but have you actually seen him take a bite of anything? I bet you haven't. Now, he's not having chewing gum. Let's watch him carefully. Watch his mouth. He's chewing again. But what do you think he's chewing? Let me move a little bit forward so that you get a better picture of him. There we go. Now what I want you ooh, what I want you to do is watch him carefully. Okay, are you watching him? Watch him chewing. And I'm going to tell you what he's chewing just now, but it, you're going to be able to see. Let's just see. Are you looking? He's not very polite, is he? I'm sure your mum and dad have told you you must eat with your mouth closed. This kudu is not really polite. He's not eating with his mouth closed. Now watch him. Watch his neck. Are you watching? Did you see that, everybody? He just basically vomited into his own mouth. Ugh! That's disgusting. Can you imagine? Now the reason he's doing that is because he is chewing the cud. Now I imagine that you've heard the term chewing the cud before. And that means that he is chewing the food that he ate before, and that's because he's what we call a ruminant. Now all the deer that you have, and all of the antelope that we have, and all the cows and cattle, they are all cud chewers, they're ruminants, which means when they eat the food that they eat for the first time, there he did it again, you saw, they just swallow it almost whole, then they store it in the first part of the stomach, and then later, when they're having a bit of a relax and standing in the shade like this chap is doing, well, then they re-chew their food. And it's a very, very efficient way of eating. Nathaniel, what a very good question. You want to know why could you have humps? It's not so much a hump as it is a shoulder. That's just where his shoulders are, Nathaniel. It's not really a hump. There may be a little bit of fat there, and that fat there will help him when it's dry or when there's not much to eat. Watch him again. <laughs> you can see the top of his ears, they're a bit scratched. And they're a bit scratched and torn because he lives in thick bush, you see. And so he needs to walk through the thorns and thorns like that zizzy force which I gave to Viem. Well, they will tear his ears. And Caleb, while they're standing here, of course, doesn't know, you can't tell whether they run fast or not. But I can tell you that any animal out here that runs slowly, well, it's going to be eaten by a leopard or a lion or a hyena or a wild dog or a cheetah or even a jackal. 
So yes, kudu can run very, very fast. There are many, many very fast animals out here, and most of them much, much faster than us. I know that you guys like to think that you're very fast, and we also like to think we're very fast as adults, but we're not, you know, compared with most of the animals out here, we are very, very slow. All right, let's carry on up the road here and see what else we can find. Now, Jackson, you want to know whether those are male or female kudu. The males are the ones with the horns, and the females have no horns. So there were some females there, and there were some males as well. I... Some females and some males. The male with the horns, the female with no horns. Now, we're going to go on to this reserve over here and see if we can't find any more tracks of the female leopard that we had earlier. Ooh, there's an elephant. Do you see the elephant, Vian? I bet you didn't. Viam. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to get a bit closer quite quickly. Oh, here, they're, they're right here, everybody. Now, this is the biggest animal that you'll find here. Can you see it? Not even Viam has seen it yet. And yet there's an elephant somewhere in the bush here. Look, look over there. You can just see some of the leaves moving. You see that? See that? Just behind there, everybody, is the world's biggest land animal, an elephant. Let's go and look. Now we're going to move very slowly towards the elephant because we don't want to give him a fright because if we give him a fright, he'll give us a fright. That looks like a little one. And when you see one little one, then you've got to look everywhere around to make sure that you know where all the elephants are. There we go. So this is a small elephant, everybody. The rest of the herd, I think, is behind him. He's still very big, though. Yeah, there's another big one coming across the road. Look at that. That's a big cow. Big female elephant. And there's an even bigger one behind there. Look at that huge grey shape. They are very big. They stand about 10 feet at the shoulder. So where that kudu had a hump, he was about 6 feet and 2 inches. That big elephant there is about 10 feet at the same height. And this one is probably about 8 years, oh no, maybe 6 years old, this elephant here. Isn't that nice? And he's not shy to see us, which is great. What we don't want is them to be afraid of seeing us. And so we drive slowly up to them so that they aren't afraid of us. Right, so from a little elephant here, Brent has got a very big elephant bull. So look at this. This is a really big, big elephant bull. Now, he probably weighs around 6,000 kilograms. He's massive in his prime, probably about 40 years old. Let's just move forward a bit. Hello, big boy. Okay, Nathaniel. I was just saying, you can get to about six, he's probably around 6,000 kilograms, and the biggest ever recorded, or heaviest ever recorded elephant was 9,000 kilograms, nine tons. And I know you guys out there in America, and Nathaniel, you use pounds. So, here we go. He's probably, this one next to us, has probably around 13, 13 and a half thousand pounds. And, and and at the top of his shoulder, and that's the tallest point in his body, he's, this one's probably around 10 feet tall, and that's the top of his shoulder. And he's busy chewing on a marula tree. 
But these big bulls, obviously, oh, oh yeah, look at that, he's breaking the branches and he's chewing to get to the bark. And just under the bark is a thing called the cambium layer. Now, what that does is it transports water and nutrients from the roots of the tree up into the rest of the tree. And obviously, a big animal like that, he needs lots of nutrients to survive. Now, he probably eats about 400, 500 pounds of trees and grass a day. Bosman's wondering, why does he have tusks? Now, there's two main reasons elephants have tusks. One is it helps them to feed. It helps them to peel bark off, off the... You hear him crunching away on that branch. Um, it helps them to peel bark off trees to eat. And for a big bull like this, it helps him to fight. So when he wants to find a girlfriend, he's got to go fight all the other boys. And those tusks will help him. Now you can see he's got a very long nose. And we call that a trunk. And Kaylin's wondering, do they eat with their trunk? Kaylin, their trunk is very important. Look how you can see he moves it around, puts it in his mouth. So their trunk, they use to pick up food, uh, to smell, to drink with. So a very important. And yes, they do use their trunk for feeding. So, we're just talking about his big nose, the trunk. Aaron's wondering, how does an elephant drink? Well, Aaron, what he does is he sucks all that water. And he can suck about just under two gallons of water into his, into his nose. And then he'll put his nose in his mouth and then spray it like a big straw, but working the opposite way into his mouth. Now, elephants can talk to each other, but they talk to each other in a very low rumble that's quite difficult for us to hear. You can see his big flapping ears, so he can hear things far, far away. And they speak in these low communications that sound a little bit like this. So, the big bulls are normally by themselves, so the males, unless they're looking for girlfriends, stay by themselves, so the mommies and babies all live in breeding herds, and you normally find the big bulls like this either by themselves or in a group of two or three. Elephants are gentle giants, and he is just the most magnificent big boy. But North Landing Elementary, it's been great having you on safari with us. And don't forget, you can join us when you're not in school as well. Just ask your teacher how. But hopefully, we'll have you on another live safari shortly. But for now, toodaloo. But one last look at the big Ellie. And while we leave this gentleman to munch on, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. Hello everybody, we've come on to Arethusa and we're hoping to go and see those Solala lionesses and the young male. And they're not too far from here, they're just in front of the Arethusa camp. 
and we're going to do our very best to get in there. I'm just struggling a little bit with the radio to find out who's there and who isn't. So we're going to drive slowly that way. I'm pretty sure that by the time we get there, we'll be able to get in. Now, just be aware that if we do get into that sighting, it's going to be pretty silent uh, from your point of view. I won't be able to hear you. We can't copy the... It's right in the middle of a kind of dip. So it's very difficult for us to copy what the final control is saying to us. So they can't really relay your questions. So we won't be there for too long. But you know, it's such a perfect little sight. There's uh, water, there's shade, and it's dappled light, and it's just very beautiful where well, it was this morning. I'm not sure what it'll be like today, this afternoon. But we'll go and have a look-see. But first, we'll pop into the waterhole at Arethusa. Just listening. Ah. So we'll just pop down towards the Arethusa Dam. See what we can find around there. Sorry, the radio is very loud in my ear now. Just go a little bit faster. Make sure that I know, ooh, there's another kudu. Lovely big male kudu. Second lovely kudu that we've seen so far. He's just standing. You saw him jump there, maybe, as we bumped on the road. Very nervous they are, Kudu. Always. Those ears, I mean, I know, like I said to the kids, like the big bad wolf, all the better to hear with. Well, that really is genuinely what they're for. And they're pretty nervous. This guy also chewing his cud. Hello, Sid. A very nice one from you, and I think you're... Uh, I mean, it's a question that we get asked quite a lot, and it's a very good one. Do antelope get mesmerized by headlights in the same way that deer do? Yes, exactly the same. They get completely mesmerized, and that's why at night, when we drive around here with a spotlight, if we come across, say, a herd of impala or a herd of kudu, we flick the lights off. Otherwise, they start running towards the lights, kind of blind and... Um, it's, I, I find it a bizarre behavior. I don't really understand it. I'm not sure why it should happen. Because, I mean, as human beings, we should, certainly would be the last thing that we do is run towards the light. But anyway, that's what they do. You don't find them running towards the sun, do you? But absolutely exactly the same. More elephant tracks on the road. I think that we're going to find lots and lots of elephants around this area, close to the Arethusa Dam, as we go closer towards the very dry parts of the season. And the herds are also going to get that much larger. Hello, Melissa from North Carolina. Very nice question from you. Uh, you know, we talk about naming leopards and we name the lions and your question is basically, I suppose, do we do the same with the other animals around here? Do we give them names? Do we t keep track of the families and the herds? The answer is when we can, yes, we do. So, for example, let's take cheetah, which tend to move a little more widely and more nomadically than lions and leopards. We know of two male cheetah that use cheetah plains quite a lot in the northern parts of Biffles Hook. But, you know, because they roam so widely, they're seldom on the reserves where we know them. So we don't give them names, but we do watch them and we watch their progress. Now, if you go to something like elephants, which are not territorial, which means they move around in areas in a home range that they don't defend, which means the area is normally pretty large, well, then it's difficult to keep track on them. We do recognize certain elephants from obvious features, like, for example, we watch a little family or a little herd of elephants where the matriarch has got the bottom third of her trunk missing. So her and her offspring are very easy to identify, but a lot of the time it's very difficult to identify which elephants are which. And I think of the example of 
an elephant cow we've called Fang because she's got a very long kind of uh, uh, tusk and that tusk which is recurved and points backwards is very obvious and makes her easy to to recognize but because of um, that it's easy to recognize that we don't see her very often so we know that we don't see them very often so it's mainly only the animals that are territorial within our area that we take the time to look at. We're just going to examine the water hole here, doesn't seem to be much here. While we do that, let's head across to Brent Leo Smith who's got a water buck. Now isn't this just an absolutely gorgeous late winter's afternoon scene, a lovely big male water buck quenching his thirst at the Buffalo's Hook water hole. I was hoping to find some elephants but Sometimes it's quite nice to spend some time with the other members around. Let me go. And quintessentially Sabi Sands. Um, Sabi Sands is the greater game reserve we're in, and the waterbuck, a male waterbuck, is the emblem for the Sabi Sands. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? You can see the reflection lovely on the water. These water holes are such vital cogs in the ecosystem, especially in the dry season, and even more so this year with this drought we're experiencing. It looks like he's had his fill, oh, and he's going to head off. There's also a lovely bird, a grey heron. Oh, look at him jogging first, actually. He needed, needed some speed, engage second gear to get up the hill. There's a grey heron looking for any little aquatic insects or frogs that might be around. Now this water hole's dried up once already this this year with the drought we're having and then we luckily got some late rain that filled it up quite a bit. Not very deep at the moment. And then one of the more common residents of water holes in this part of the world is a good old buffalo bull. Dugger boy is what they are called. Now the reason they call called Dugger is if you have a look at him he's caked in mud. Now in the sort of South African history in terms of the mines uh, the Dugger boys were the toughest and roughest and always caked in cement. So they used to mix cement for building and I'm quite renowned for sort of knife fights and overindulgence and in alcohol and ladies and, and any type of thing but they were incredibly tough and incredibly dangerous and the fact that these old buffalo bulls are constantly covered in mud and that's a Zulu word for that sort of cement is dagger and that grey mud that sticks to them is where that story comes from and where they got the nickname dagger boy is on foot they are one of the more dangerous animals we encounter. Not so much when buffalo and big breeding herds, but when they are these lone bulls like this, they are part of breeding herds. They're quite old, normally between 12, 12 to 15 years old, and hearing might be a little bit affected, and of course being by themselves they're not as aware, and not so many sets of eyes to see any potential threats. And they often stay around the river systems, water holes, sleep in thickets. So you often see them when they're very, very close to you. And sometimes within that sort of flight or fright zone. So, oh, he's going he's gonna to lie down. Oh, yes, old man. You deserve to lie down. And all the flies, you can actually see he's got, can you see them on camera, Brian? There's a, literally a swarm of flies irritating him. Now that causes them to roll in the mud to try help with all those fly bites. And if I got bitten by that many flies on a daily basis, I think I'd also be quite a cantankerous old, old devil. So we're going to move along, see what else we can find. And just remember, if you want to ask myself or James a question, just pop us an email uh, to questions at wildearth.tv 
or use the hashtag Safari Live if you're a, a tweeter. So the reason we're checking these areas at the moment is that the Nkuma Lioness Nkuma Lioness either has her cubs in one of these drainage lines here, the second one. So we're pretty sure she's uh, given birth. We actually haven't had confirmation of the cubs just yet, but we're just constantly checking. This is the closest water uh, if she has used this little river system here. Um, if she's used the other river system, then the closest water will be the, the Juma Pan. So keep always keep a lookout and she might arrive at strange times to drink there in the middle of the day. But, uh, so we're just having a quick look to see if we can find any of the tracks. Hello, Bill. He's in New Jersey. Bill's asking, isn't an old buffalo bull like that prone to being killed by a predator because of old age? Uh, most definitely, Bill. Uh, animals out in the bush don't really die of old age. They generally get caught by a predator first. So the older you are, the more chance that you are going to become someone's dinner. Now the only animal that really hunts buffalo here in this area is, uh, is lions and uh, a single buffalo bull like that would definitely be a target for a, for a pride of lions. Hi, Zach. Zach's uh, put forward a very interesting, interesting question. Why do lions not see humans as a food source? Have they been conditioned? They have over many hundreds of thousands of years, Jack. Zach. Now, they do see us as a food source, just not during the day. Uh, man has evolved into the dominant diurnal predator. Uh, and lions will nine times out of ten run away from you or even when you're on foot walking through the bush during the day however as soon as darkness falls you are very much within a lion's prey spectrum and they will actively and happily hunt you if you wander around at night now that's one of the reasons people like to go home when it's dark it's our evolutionary instincts kicking in saying stuff out in the night is gonna eat me but as soon as the sun comes up, it's safe again. Relatively speaking, of course. Now we're checking for the Inkahuma lioness. One has cubs, I think, behind us. Another, we know for sure, has cubs in Torchwood. And Deborah, the armchair traveler, is wondering how old do lion cubs need to be before they're introduced to the pride? Well, Deborah, it depends on the pride, but it's normally around a month and a half to two months old sometimes even a little bit later sometimes a bit earlier but i think it's a, a mean safe average would be around two months they are just the cutest little things lion cubs but so far no tracks just yet
So we're going to duck up to the eastern edge of our traverse area, see if we can find any sign of movement of big cats and maybe a big herd of eddies would also be nice. So we've just left a live buffalo. Let's go look at a dead one with James. There is a vulture, everybody, and we've come into the area where the lions were. I know they are still in this area because I can see a whole lot of vehicles around, well, two vehicles, around where the actual lions are. But I just thought I'd show you these two, what we call hooded vultures. They are the kind of, uh, well, they're the kind of lower echelon vulture society. They don't really have much status. And they come to the site to these kind of carcasses and they feed only once the white-backed vultures, which are much more numerous and much larger. Once they have finished feeding, then the hooded vulture gets to eat. Now, what you will notice about them compared with most vultures is that they've got that very small pin-like little beak. And that means that they're able to get at flesh, animal flesh, in amongst the bones where the other vultures and certainly most of the predators are completely unable to get. And so they have specially adapted to sort of finishing off the last little bits of sinew and that sort of thing. Now, when I'll show you, show you exactly what it is they want to eat, but just, that's an incredible picture actually. Look at the sharpness of the little, and it's like a dentist's pick, the end of that little beak. And it's not so little, I mean, that vulture's at least three feet long. And he's got that rather pathetic little head of hair on him that makes him look like a, a, an English judge. Isn't that nice? Now, I'll show you what he's been eating, or what he's hoping to try and eat. They'll be a little bit nervous to come onto the ground with us here, but over there is the carcass. And let me just move my head out of the way. That's the buffalo. And I don't know how many of you were watching this morning, but there was a lot of meat left on that buffalo carcass. And I guess those lions have eaten their fill. Let me just move my head further out of the way. They've eaten their fill. I think there have been lots of vultures around here today. It certainly looks like it's been picked clean by the larger vulture species. And Probably before game drive started, even these little white no, hooded vultures would have been down here with their dentist pick beaks, picking out the little bits of sinew that are left. Mm. Very interesting situation that occurred here, and we're not really sure how, why, but obviously when we came through yesterday, two male lions were here. They were eating it. The two were timber males, ginger and hairy belly. They disappeared sometime during the night, seems to have gone off south. Then when they arrived here this morning, this was before, just before we got here, there were hyenas eating it. And then those three lions pulled in somewhere around sort of half past seven this morning. And they chased the hyenas off and we had an incredible sighting over here. Let's move down towards where the lions are and we'll get a nice view of them, hopefully. I suspect that they are fast asleep but you can see how perfect this little situation is. Lovely dappled light in the shade, water for the animals to drink, delicious meal if you happen to be a vulture or a lion or even a hyena. For us, not so much. But at the if it was fresh, yes, quite. And we had a fire to cook it on. And Carla, you say they sure did a good job on that buffalo. Absolutely they did, didn't they? They've completely, completely eaten it. There was lots of meat left this morning. Just ease our way through here. There's a lion, right here. Having a drink or smelling in the bushes. I'm not sure we'll get a much better view. We might. No, we will from here. What is she's doing? You know what she's doing? She's eating grass. She's trying to line her stomach. How's that, Vim? Look forward. Mm, that's horrendous, isn't it? There we go. There you can see just eating some grass. And of course, 
you know, there's really not a lot of uh, roughage in the lion diet. And we had a great question today about why animals lick carcasses. So why does this lioness lick carcass before she eats? I think it's to get hair into the stomach for roughage, but I probably you'll probably find that the cellulose and lignin in grass is a better way of lining the digestive tract. She's had a big fat meal now. She'll want to get rid of that meal eventually, uh, with my luck probably in front of us. And that will be facilitated by eating some fiber rich food. I love seeing animals in this kind of light in the sort of deep green. Let me try and move a little forward. You might get a slightly better view of her. I think this is the other lioness. So by the other, I mean the pride is kind of dominated, well not dominated I guess. The oldest member of the pride is a female with, yeah that's probably about as good as we're going to get at the moment, is a female without a tail. Now this lioness is pale, you can see she's quite pale around the, the neck. Uh, she's not quite a white lion but she's certainly much paler than most lions I've seen. And she's got a full tail. And the other member of this little pride here at the moment is a young male of about two and a half to three years, I think. Now, we don't often see them. They're almost without a territory, these chaps. Or I suppose this could be considered the very northern reaches of their territory. But it certainly overlaps with the Styx pride to the east of where we are now. And definitely within Kuhumas to the west and to the north. And that's why they were very skittish this morning. They didn't, they, every time they took a bite, they'd sort of dive into the carcass, bloody their noses, and then look up and make sure that there was nothing coming to attack them. You want to go forward, okay? Say when. Oh, I see that was very clever of you, Liam. Very clever indeed. Yam's not just a pretty face, everybody, bedecked with a fine red beard. Ginger. Ginger beard, yes. She really is uh, grazing. She looks a little bit like a sort of bushbuck having a meal. Like she's browsing. Though. Yeah, she's maybe browsing even. Unless she's carried a piece of the... No, she's definitely eating grass. <laughs> She's a vegetarian. <laughs> Hello, little Gracie, aged eight in Ohio. You want to know the buffalo will make the <laughs> lion sick. Gracie, you know, you've seen this before. You know that these lions can eat the worst kind of most disgusting meat in the world. It doesn't make them sick. We don't really know why, except that we know that they have very powerful digestive systems, so they've got lots of acid. Now, acid is something that will kind of burn away and dissolve just about anything, so they've got lots of acid in their stomachs. They've got very powerful enzymes, which is a special kind of chemical that helps them to digest bacteria and protein in their stomachs. So, even though it would make you and I very sick indeed, uh, we won't be able to, we wouldn't be able to eat that at all, but this lioness and her friends, well, they can eat in just about anything, and even something that you wouldn't think about smelling, so they can eat those. And the other interesting thing about this lioness, everyone, is that she's also got very amber eyes, rather like our friend Amber Eyes. Sandy, you reckon these lions don't look like they're in very good condition? Um, I don't think that they are a bad condition. I think you say you reckon their fur's not so good. No, I think their fur looks all right, Sandy. You know, she's got she's good meat around the shoulders. Her hips aren't showing. I think she's in pretty good condition. She's lean. Look, she's she is quite lean. She's also still quite young, though. I think, and so she's not going to be as large and beefy as some of those very mature um, Kahuma lionesses. I suppose she could be a little fatter, but I don't think she's in bad shape, Sandy. I've seen lions in far worse shape. 
The big in indicator, of course, as it is with most animals, is if their hips start to stick out at the back. And those aren't sticking, sticking out. And those scratches and things are probably just from, you can see Zizifus thorn sticking into her. She doesn't seem to mind at all. Cecilia, I'm sorry I missed your question. You say, is there a, is a viral video of three lionesses drinking something somewhere? Oh, licking water off a couple's tent. Yes, I have seen it. Absolutely amazing video. So for those of you who haven't seen it, there were some people camping uh, somewhere wild. I'm not sure where it was exactly. And the moisture from the dew condensed on their tent while they were snoozing in it and they woke up the next morning to find two or three lionesses licking the moisture off the tent <laughs> and they filmed it from inside and the lions I think just wandered off eventually unbelievable unbelievable experience those people had I've no doubt they were absolutely terrified by it I probably would have been fairly terrified by it too but they turned out to be absolutely fine but what an incredible experience to have had. There we can see this vegetarian lioness. That's probably why she looks lean, Sandy. She doesn't eat meat. I'm talking absolute rubbish, of course. She does eat meat. Matthew, I think I know where this question comes from. You say, do lions have a good sense of smell? They do have a good sense of smell, Matthew, a very good sense of smell, but you wouldn't think so, because if you go to a carcass where they're eating, it smells like the bowels of hell itself, and yet the lions will happily chomp away and eat that disgusting meat, the sort of rotting offal that comes out of the middle of a buffalo. They'll eat that with pleasure, and it makes you wonder how on earth could they possibly smell anything if they're prepared to eat that. Well, it's just that their impression of smell is very different from ours. And they'll pick up, say, the scent of a human being walking close by uh, far faster than we would be able to. They probably also can smell their prey when they are on the hunt. And so they have a very sensitive sense of smell. It's just a different idea in their minds as to what's good to smell and what's horrible to smell. This is wonderful, you know, I'd like, I've got to tell you, this is a special sighting. First of all, we're seeing her eat a lot of grass, which I think is fascinating. Secondly, it's only about half past four in the afternoon, and, well, it's a quarter past four in the afternoon, and this lion is actually doing something other than lying down. Look at the beautiful green colours here, with her pale sort of golden fur. I think this is just stunning. <laughs> I missed the name, I'm afraid, because the communications are just too rough at the moment. I think it's Maritza or something like that in North Carolina. And you want to know about whether or not lions, is there, is there anything they don't eat? Well, normally they don't eat a great deal of vegetation. I wouldn't think they'd eat this common spike thorn, for example. There's no meat they won't eat. Um, I've, I have this, you will hear rumours that they don't eat waterbuck, for example, because waterbuck have a kind of strongly scented uh, fur, but no, they will eat waterbuck. There is one thing that I have heard that they don't eat, and I've not seen it myself because we don't get many of them here. But that's something called a bush pig. And a bush pig is quite closely related to a warthog. And they seem sometimes to kill them and then just leave them. And they also, also sometimes, if they kill uh, something like a hyena, they would generally not eat the hyena. But if we're going to go forward. I'm just going to move out the way here so that this fellow can leave in front of us. It's gonna, you may lose the picture here as we go under here because we're going to have to fold the aerial down. We're going to make it under this here. We're going to have to drop the aerial fully. There we go. 
Righty ho. Right, while we're doing this, let's go across to Brent. We'll try and get another view of these lions, see what Brent has found. So, Brian and I, being the killer bees and the eternal optimists that we are, uh, have failed on the northeastern side. So, they've just recently dragged our southern boundary. Now, fingers crossed that we're going to find a beautiful, dainty female leopard track as well as two little cub tracks following it in. Uh, so, we're going to just check very carefully along the road. A bit easier now that they've dragged it recently. So we are hoping to find Queen the Karula, the dominant female leopard of Juma Private Game Reserve. But alas, no tracks so far. But it has been a, quite quiet on the Juma side. Uh, we saw a couple of more elephant bulls, but way in the distance. And the breeding herd seems to have moved off. I'm hoping they will come back soon. Uh, I don't think they're going to be gone for too long. There are just so many elephants around. I think we're just maybe having a quiet elephant day. Lisa in North Carolina is wondering about disease in animals here and if a predator eats an, a, a prey species that's diseased, will they contract that disease? Now in a lot of cases, Nisa, that uh, happens the predators will be immune to uh, a lot of the diseases that are focused to, to ruminants or bovids, but in certain circumstances it can. And the most common one that jumps over uh, in the predator-prey scenario is a bovine tuberculosis mutates uh, specifically with lion, leopard and becomes a feline tuberculosis and uh, although now it seems like a lot of the, the lions and that are developing natural immunity to it but disease is part of nature just as the death is so it's not uncommon for those things to happen so while we continue to scour the southern boundary for lions, I mean for leopard tracks, I know James has got some other kitty cats to show you. You won't believe this everybody, but uh, these lions have killed again. Not while you were gone, but quite apart from the affection you're seeing from the grass-eating lion with her tailless friend, the young male is devouring the remains of a young male warthog. Now that must have been killed today. Obviously happened to wander past this setting by mistake and was set upon by the lions. Now we're often asked questions about whether or not lions will sort of eat when they're full, whether they'll kill again if the opportunity presents itself and absolutely they will, clearly. Isn't that amazing? I think that's absolutely astonishing. So they cannot be hungry. And Dylan, a very good question from you as to why hyenas don't eat, at least lions don't eat hyenas. I don't know. I can only think that the reason they don't eat hyenas is because they, you know, they eat such foul things and so their flesh is probably almost toxic. Now that's difficult to kind of understand when you think about the foulness that they are prepared to eat. So they're prepared to eat the most kind of rancid buffalo meat, so why wouldn't they eat a, a hyena? I don't know. I don't know for sure, but I think it's probably got a lot to do with what they eat and the fact that their flesh therefore tastes disgusting in much the same way 
as the flesh, for example, of the bush pig we think tastes disgusting to lions. So, unbelievable poor warthog. I mean, of all the places to come wandering past today, this was the wrong one. Anyway, we'll see what happens here. We won't be here for too long, everyone. I think let's just enjoy for a little while, and then we'll move out and see what else we can find. Aaron, in New Zealand, a very valid question, a very obvious question, and one to which you would expect me to know the answer immediately. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to check it for you while we watch these lions. You want to know why it is that we don't see bush pig on Juma? I'm just going to retrieve my mammal book, but my guess while I retrieve my mammal book is that the habitat is just not right. I think they prefer more forested areas, more thickly vegetated areas, and that's why you will find them every so often in the Sabi sands along the rivers, so in the thick kind of deep bush of the rivers, but otherwise you won't find them here. Now we don't have many forests in this area. You will find them up I think in Pafuri, where there are some examples of sand forest and very thick riverine vegetation. But I'll just have a quick look in my little book. This is such a perfect place to sit. I can't tell you how the atmosphere here is, apart, well, not for that warthog, it's miserable for that warthog, but for the rest of us, it really is just very pleasant. Okay, so the bush pig, a wide range of forested and woodland habitats with a distinct preference for valley bottoms with dense vegetation and soft soils. I'm going to give myself a pat on the back. Thank you very much. That was a correct guess. That's why we don't get them here. So I guess the ecological equivalent in drier areas would be the warthog. Now Kay in Denver, you ask a very valid question, of course, because we, we tend to think of hyenas as being the great scavengers of the wild. And you say, could they have stolen this warthog? It's possible, but it's highly unlikely. I think that they moved into this area after they finished that buffalo. They lay down on what is, looks to be very comfortable sand. I think the warthog probably happened upon this area. It is very kind of dry away from the riverbed here. Probably walked through here thinking, I'll just go and pick me up some nice green grass on the fringes of the drainage line and happened to step into its death, basically. Stepped into these three lions who thought, oh, we'll, we'll have that, thank you very much, and whacked it. So I don't think that they stole it. It doesn't look like it's been fed on for very long. Very lucky we are. Zoe, a nice question for you about nu nutrition and kind of pr uh, the physiology of pregnancy. You, none of these lionesses I don't think are pregnant, but you do say, and we know that we've been seeing pregnant and lactating females with the Nkahuma pride, you say, well, they eat differently, kind of because they're pregnant. I don't think they consciously do, um, and I don't know for sure, but I'm going to make another educated guess. And my educated guess is as follows. For most animals, of course, the limiting factor when pregnant, this elephant in front of us, this is going to be interesting, I can hear an elephant moving through here, can't see him yet, anyway, let me just quickly get on to this, so the limiting nutrient, macronutrient for pregnant females is fat, of course, and that's because the fat in the milk is a crucial, crucial nutrient for the babies to grow in, and not to grow in, but to, to digest and absorb. And so maybe a lioness would go for more fatty things. Maybe she'd try and get at the organs a bit more. Maybe she'd try and get at the marrow inside the bones a little bit more than some of the other lionesses would. That is possible. But I don't know for sure.
Now lion eyes, we're watching these lions obviously and <laughs> VMP, if you can just go quickly to the male again if you don't mind. Very nice super zoom shots there of the feet. Lion eyes, you want to know if they eat the skin. Now watch him, he is fastidiously avoiding eating the skin. You see how he's sort of chewing the bones and he's now he's using his tongue and his front teeth to get the flesh away from the skin. That skin is probably about a fifth of an inch, so half a centimeter wide. Very difficult to digest unless you're a hyena. Hyena will eat that. But, uh, well, and sorry, that's the warthog. It's slightly thinner skin than that. But these lion, the lions will still try and avoid eating it. You can see there. So he's folded that skin, and the whiteness of that skin is because he's been licking it using his sandpaper-like tongue to scrape off the protein and the red meat. Look at his claws, aren't those amazing? Gee whiz, that's a wonderful shot of the claws there. Look at those. You wouldn't want to be involved on the other end of those things. There we go, licking away the meat on the skin there, as opposed to trying to eat it and cut it up. Oh, look at his eyes. Fantastic, fantastic camera work there, VMP. Good job. Thank you, James. Well, you know, must give compliments where they're new sometimes. Here's the elephant. VM, look, straight in front of us. I think this is the same must bull we had in this area this morning. He came past these lions, he chased them. They were very cross. He was very cross. And he's come back here simply because for the same reason the warthog did. There's green vegetation here for him to eat. Look at him smelling us. And he'll smell the lions and you'll be able to smell the smell of dead warthog flesh. amazing. Wow, that's a stroke of luck. <laughs> that is fantastic. Let's see what he does. He's going to struggle to come straight towards us from there because it is, he's in a very deep drainage line. But if he keeps going along it, he's going to happen upon these lions who are going, he, <laughs> who are going to get a nasty surprise. They're totally unsighted. They're in a sort of S-bend. So there's the drainage line feeds around like that towards here where the lions are. So the lions will have no idea that the elephant's there. They've just looked up now because the vultures moved. So let's see what happens. This could be fascinating. So the elephant is basically walking along the drainage line there. stopped now and he's totally silent. He's only about maybe 40 feet away from us here. 50 feet. <laughs> they know something's up. You can see there just one of the females has lifted her head. The male is gorging himself. Now of course I've had a little bit of experience with this elephant bull this morning. And he wasn't that impressed to see us, but he wasn't too worried about us either. So I'm not too concerned about sitting here and waiting and see what happens. You might also be able to hear the crunching now of the carnassial teeth of the young male. And thank you all for your screenshots. Brilliant stuff. There. So he is, he's, he's, there we go, he is eating some of the skin. He might just be pulling it off. No, he's certainly having a... <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's either eating it or sucking it. Let's see what happens here. No, he's just sucking it. See? He's just sucking at it. But let's see if he bites it up. He might. I'm sure he's going to take a piece. So it's not totally indigestible to him, clearly. 
you he's got a bit of rib cage in there as well now his teeth now he's heard the elephant now he's looked up his teeth much like your dogs or your cats and if you've got one handy a uh, small dog obviously not a large doberman or something like that grab it or your cat and uh, just tell it that you're going to be friendly and then peel back the back of the lips of your domestic dog or cat and you will notice that the molar teeth unlike ours don't close on top of each other they close to the side of one another the bottom jaw I think going underneath the top jaws teeth but actually touching them and they create a scissors kind of effect and it allows these lions know something's up it what it allows is for him to cut the meat off the skin and off the bone and also to cut up the skin like that oh that's a nice piece isn't it Vim? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I just want to show you the only evidence of the elephant at the moment is this gently swaying tree in front of us. You can see with the golden lights coming through over that tree, you can just see it swaying gently. It's obviously stopped swaying gently now. Come on, shake it again. Well, that's where he is. He's just behind there. Here he comes. Impy. He's just moving now. There, you can see him. Let's see what happens now. <laughs> so he, he is still unsighted, okay? He cannot see the lions. They're basically to the front and to the right of him. There we go. That's a p brilliant shot. Okay, so this spit of land in front of us is kind of hiding them from him and him from them, of course. Now he's coming around the spit. Let's see what he does. He might just walk straight out of the drainage line. But elephants do not like lions. The male spotted spotted him or he's heard him. I still can't see. There we the tailless lioness has seen something. Now that elephant will be able to hear that sound. He'll hear the tearing of flesh. And if he's particularly cross, he'll come around here and look. Otherwise, he'll just kind of look with disdain and then move off. Oh, he stopped. I'm sure he's listening and smelling. We can't see him, obviously. He's just behind there, through that mass of bushes. Oh, you can see him. That's fantastic. I can't see him from where I'm sitting. Brilliant, Viam. Is he looking this way? Can you see? I think his head's facing us. Yeah, yeah that's right. There we go. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> Lions are up. Now we're going to have to just be quite aware here that he doesn't take us for a predator, which no one really wants. Trying to smell us. We can't really go anywhere at this stage other than backwards, so I'm just going to wait to see what happens. We don't want him to confuse us for lions, do we? Vim? No, we don't. No. Certainly not.
You just hang there, buddy. The lions are watching him. They're kind of in a stalk position. To kind of cause trouble. But he doesn't like the smell of flesh and he doesn't like the smell of his lions. He's too close to take a decent photograph of. He's only about 10 meters in front of us, about 30 feet, smelling. And Susan, you say your heart is beating too, and so are the lions. Look at them, all three of them watching. And again, I say this, but there's no doubt as to the royalty of the bushes. These lions did not stand down or stand up for anything. The lions are like the mafia of the bush. They're not the royalty. This is the royalty in front of us, the bull elephant. He's a youngish bull, probably about 25 years old. He's definitely must. And the light in there is too wonderful. Just took two steps forward towards the lions and they've skedaddled. Body. We haven't moved. The elephant has turned to face us slightly. If he takes another step forward, I am going to just reverse to give him a chance to move past us unhindered. I don't think that this was going to be his original pathway. No, I think his original pathway was going to be back towards where he's going now. But I just want to give him a way, A, to get to the lions, and B, to get away from us if he wants to. There we go. Not sure if he can get down there towards the lions. While he's there, I'm going to just reverse two meters. There we go. <laughs> he just kicked off a whole heap of sand onto that hapless dead warthog. Unbelievable, this. Unbelievable. I'm just going to reverse slightly so I can give him a chance if he wants to get at the lions. 
I want to, you must have that ability. You mustn't be afraid of where we are. might get a better view of everything from slightly further back. Oh, there we go. Is that at all good to you, then? Um, not ideal. A little bit further back. Oh, I think we're going to miss out here. Anyway, I'm going to stop here. Now what I've done is I've opened up a, the path that he was kind of walking on. Just see if he can, wants to come down towards the lions. Now that's not because I think he should have a go at the lions, it's just because I don't think that we should be getting in the way of anything that might happen. We want to have as little effect as possible. That very pale blonde lioness is now deeply bored by the fact that the royalty is in. You might hear him going, that's his hair going. We'll just sit here for a little while, everybody. I know it's not the best view in the world. You see him at all, Vim? Yeah? 